We have a profound power that we can use every day, more important than ever at a time when we feel so pushed around. We have a profound power every day to use our mind, to change our brain, to change our mind for the better, mm. you know, for the sake of others as well as ourselves. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today we're talking with Dr. Rick Hansen, who's a psychologist as well as a senior fellow at UC Berkeley and New York Times bestselling author about brain science and awareness or awakening. He has a new book out called Neurodharma, and we're going to talk about seven principles that we can learn from the ancient teachings and the latest on neuroscience to make us happier, healthier, more content, and have our brains be way more resilient, especially at a time of a lot of chaos, confusion, anxiety. This is a fascinating interview. I've been wanting to interview Dr. Rick Hansen for quite some time. I think you're going to love it. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Perowin, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a psychologist, senior fellow of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley and a New York Times bestselling author. He's lectured at NASA, congratulations NASA, Google, Oxford, and Harvard, and taught in meditation centers worldwide. His thoughts and ideas on positive neuroplasticity and resilience have been featured on the BBC, CBS, NPR, and many other major media outlets. He's the author of six books that have been published in over 29 different languages. His latest book, Neurodharma, explores the intersection of ancient wisdom with the latest science to help readers embrace joy, happiness, and contentment. Dr. Rick Hansen, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Drew, it's a pleasure to be here. Please call me Rick. And um, I thank you for having me on. I have a lot of respect for what Mark does, Dr. Hyman, and, and you. And so I'm glad to be here. Oh, it's an honor to have you. We've been uh, wanting to do an interview with you some time, so yeah. I'm glad it, uh, it worked out. You know, the current state of the world that we're in, I wanted to share something that you wrote on social mm -hmm. media the other day and uh, have you expand on it for our, our listeners here. So you posted something the other day and you said, sometimes it's hard not to feel hopeless. Sometimes it's natural to feel stunned, shocked, powerless. And natural to be flooded with rage or fear or an overwhelming sense of sorrow. Still, even in the midst of all this, you can be mindful, aware, and present, and not entirely slept, swept away. Talk to me about the inspiration of writing that and posting it on social media the other day. Yeah, well, it's the current moment. We're talking now early June 2020 where two kinds of plagues are being confronted in a way one a literal plague the coronavirus moving through the world including in America second a long overdue reckoning with the plague of racism and social injustice uh, including in law enforcement so we're facing that and in the context of all that uh, as the great teachers have taught throughout the ages and as we see many 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 living examples today in the middle of that flood it's really important for your own well-being and coping and helping others to find some kind of footing some kind of footing in the middle of it now in Another context, maybe what you're dealing with is a cancer diagnosis or a relative who's dementing or losses of other kinds. Still, in those floods, uh, we uh, must find our footing. And one of the most profound and powerful ways to do that with tremendous amount of research evidence behind it is the fundamental simple practice of mindfulness, establishing a sense of presence, spaciousness, some witnessing, some, dis, some distance uh, inside yourself from what's happening, not out of suppressing it, but actually allowing it more fully because when you're not swept away by what you're experiencing, you can more fully embrace it. And after the storm passes, and it eventually does settle down a little bit, at least your internal reactions to it, there you still remain. Mm. Beautiful, beautifully said. Do you think in our current state of the world, is it easier to be swept away by outside forces that have an influence on us? 
you what are your thoughts it, on that? I think it is easier for two kinds of reasons that are, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but I think it's true. One is that uh, we don't have a culture that used to be found previously in which people would develop internal qualities of grit, compassion, and gratitude let's say. They would just be strong and they would feel deeply rooted themselves in a tradition, uh, in a pace of life, in a felt sense of community, closer to the land. Uh, you know, my father grew up on a ranch in North Dakota, born in 1918 on the ranch in a sod house uh, with walls three feet thick, made of basically dirt and grass. A different life, right? Second thing that I think leads to this unrootedness is our culture. It's very fast moving, uh, very focused on superficial glitter, uh, tends to come at us in many, many different kinds of ways and through wonderful developments of intertwining with the whole world, multiculturalism, you know, multilateralism, the whole world. What happens in a street market in China uh, spreads throughout the entire world. Decisions taken at, you know, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue spread throughout the world. And so it's, I think, more necessary than ever to do what we can to make the world better, absolutely for sure. And meanwhile, while we're waiting for the cavalry to come or for the world to get better, uh, we can work on ourselves every day, every breath actually. In Tibet they say, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. Every day, every breath, every minute gives us an opportunity through the science actually of positive neuroplasticity to gradually hardwire inner strengths like grit, compassion, gratitude, happiness and love into our own brains. And then on the basis of that, be more effective with the challenges around us. You know, one of the beautiful things of the times that we're in is that information is widely a lot more available. And then within that information being more available through different sorts of channels, social media, news sources, podcasting, all the different things that are out there. Uh, sometimes that information can hijack our brain a little bit if we allow it sure. to. Um, how is it that that happens? How is it that when the coronavirus first hit and we're stuck to the news, one, okay, people want to be informed, but at a certain point in time, there almost becomes, for many people, an addiction that's there. Oh, yeah. And we don't often end up prioritizing the things that we know that will make us feel good. So what's happening inside of the brain that the inputs can overtake it and cause something else to happen where we don't actually feel good or we can't pay attention to anything else besides uh, maybe sometimes the negative inputs that we're seeing. Yeah. I, it's a cliche, uh, but you know, it's true. We have a stone age brain in the 21st century or really more exactly. We have a Jurassic park brain in the 21st century. We have a early earth 600 million years ago, the beginnings of the evolution of the, of the nervous system, brain in the 21st century. In other words, we are all walking biology. And it's not just something you kind of gloss over in a college class and you know, evolution or something to really appreciate that. Our relationships with each other. We're incredibly social primates. Uh, we're used to living in small groups of 40 or so people, cooperating internally, fearing and aggressing externally most of the time in com competition for scarce supplies with other hunter-gatherer bands. And we've got a brain that is evolved to manage saber-toothed tigers or velociraptors rolling through the forest. So it's natural for us to hyper-focus on anything negative, especially if it's uh, contaminating. Arguably the very first uh, emotion that evolved was disgust, spitting something out, that's dangerous and, and bad. So we're very alarmed by anything that's contaminating. Uh, coming at us invisibly, <laughs> that's freaky. Uh, those you love most might be the greatest danger to your physical health. That's really alarming. And then meanwhile, in the center of all that, you look to leadership, your tribe, your group of 40, 50, you know, yo, we better figure this out. Can we work together on this? Can you like be listening to what's actually really happening? And then you look around and you feel your trader, your, your leaders are clueless, if not actively betraying the interests 
of, of most people. So all of that is extremely disturbing. And what happens in the brain is that it goes on red alert. It's designed to do that. It, it has what you know uh, is called a negativity bias of mixing, making the brain like Velcro for bad experiences, Teflon for, for good ones. So we hyper-focus on it, and then we ruminate about it, and then we obsess about it. It's also true, if, if I can keep going, maybe I, I hope Please. not rant too much here. Oh, no, keep uh, going. One of the amazing things that's happened in the brain in just the last million or so years is it has developed the, the sort of hardware in the midline of the cortex. If you imagine a line starting in the middle of your forehead, reaching all the way to the, toward the back of your head, you know, just before it starts to curve downward, think of a superhighway of information flowing through that midline cortex that enables us to do what's called mental time travel to reflect upon the past and imagine various futures, uh, different scenarios. Should I get Chinese or Italian food tonight? Or should I put on a mask as well as gloves when I go deal with that situation? What if they don't? How will that be for me? Imagine different things. Well, that capacity for mental time travel is fantastic, but it also leads to a lot of rumination. We tend to go right into the ruminator. Uh, research has shown that people, on average, have are in the ruminator. <laughs> you know, they have a wandering mind half the time, on average. You seem pretty mindful. You know, I've 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 trained in this stuff for a while. So for let's say you and me, there are people that are just lost in space 80% of the time, right? And so um, a lot of people are just lost in the ruminator, and most of the content of that rumination is negative. Yeah, sometimes we kind of fantasize pleasantly about what we might do over the weekend. But most of the time, we're worried, we're resentful, we're outraged, we're appalled, we're self-critical, we feel ashamed, we're angry, all that stuff in the ruminator. And since in the famous saying, neurons that fire together, wire together, we are reinforcing that crud into ourselves by being preoccupied with it. So that's a, that's a real problem. Uh, it's not our fault uh, that we have, as Paul Gilbert puts it, a tricky brain. Uh, it was designed very carefully in the forge of evolution to help our ancestors survive in extremely harsh conditions, reaching millions of years back altogether. It's not our fault, but it is our responsibility to deal with it. And I, I wanna just put out and say, uh, your program <clears throat> and the work of, um, Mark Hyman in general is a total public service to educate people about the most important organ in the body, the master organ in the body, the brain. Obviously, it's entwined with other organs, the heart, the gut, da da but to educate people about this tricky brain so that they have the tools they can use to take responsibility every day in little ways, little effective ways, most of them quite pleasurable, to gradually take charge of the brain change process and help it uh, move to a different place, a better place. Well, we can only do it by having individuals like yourself who are writing fantastic books and uh -huh. putting out great information. So I want to zoom back out and go to the start of your career because you've mentioned mm -hmm. a few fantastic concepts there and some great quotes. And, you know, you've talked about, you talked about neuroplasticity, talked about, you know, negativity bias. When you first got started in your career and looking at the brain and how it relates to all different aspects of our life. What were some of the early myths or misunderstandings that were presented to you or that you were taught that later on we found to be not true? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, and I'll try not to go into professor mode and, and, you know, sir, and also try not to rant too much here. Well, uh, so I first went to college at the end of the 1960s and early 1970s, which has given me actually a quite a personal context uh, of time of enormous tumult and positive change in America, the 60s and 70s, the, you know, uh, that, of course, uh, built upon much uh, previous, you know, developments and, and important foundations, you know, civil rights movement, environmentalism, and so forth. So I, I have some background, you know, there. And at that time, um, it was understood on the one hand that any kind of mental change must entail neural change. If a child learns to walk instead of crawl, ride a bicycle, or 20 years later, learn how to be more patient and effective when raising a family themselves, well, something has to change in the body for that person to have those capabilities for learning to occur. 
So there was a understanding clearly that it was a physical process at bottom. It wasn't magical. Whatever might be true about magic, you know, beyond ordinary reality. And I, I it's my own experience and view that that is the, indeed the case. But mainly, if not if not entirely, uh, within a scientific frame, uh, what we are hearing in this moment, remembering, wanting, loving, and hating, is the result of underlying physical processes headquartered in three pounds of tofu-like tissue inside the coconut uh, with several hundred trillion little synapses, little microprocessors sparkling away. Uh, in the phrase from the neuroscientist Charles Sherrington, like an enchanted loom continually weaving the fabric of consciousness. So on the one hand, you know, there was an understanding that the brain had a fundamental plasticity. In other words, its capacity to change. On the other hand, there was a lot of dogma that was narrow and was overvalued, that this neuroplasticity was minor and very limited, such that pretty much people were baked. <laughs> by the time they were 20. Teaching, teaching old dog new tricks. Yeah, if not by the time they were six years old, it was just baked in, and which is kind of hopeless, right? And um, also interesting politically, then leads to a notion that people are just sort of their own horrible nature, so they need a lot of authoritarian external control to keep them in line. On the other hand, as we've understood now in the last 20 years, neuroplasticity uh, is profound, it's continuous. As people are listening right now, processes are occurring in their brain that are remodeling it in terms of structure and function. A lot of that is happening at a very small level. For example, those several hundred trillion little microprocessors in your brain, you know, the synapses, you could put several thousand of them side by side in the width of just one hair. Wow, so it's very small, it's quick. Uh, neurons are typically firing five to 50 times a second. Um, well, you know, millions and millions of neurons are firing synchronously many, many times a second in coordination with each other. It's very fast. Um, and in that process, in that whole dynamic process of brain activity, um, lasting residues are left behind from lived experience, which is incredibly hopeful. It means that we have a profound power that we can use every day, more important than ever at a time when we feel so pushed around. We have a profound power every day to use our mind, to change our brain, to change our mind for the better, mm. you know, for the sake of others as well as ourselves. That's beautifully said. And I think that, you know, you mentioned something, which is that because of our previous limited more limited understanding of the brain that we thought that for the most part, it's set in stone. Yeah. That was also a mechanism of typecasting the other very and good. saying that black people are just like this. The mm -hmm. other is just like this. Yeah. This individual is just like that. If you believe and don't understand that the brain can change, you will use that besides your own projections onto a yeah. society or group of either racist thoughts or ideas, whatever it might be. There was a lot of science that was trying to be used to back it up and saying whether it's sociogenomics or understanding of the brain that, okay, this group is just like that. They're always going to yeah. be like that and there's nothing that you can do that's baked into their genetics. Yeah. And then, of course, we found out that it's not true, but it's interesting how the science was used to perpetuate an idea or a concept. Yeah. Um, for example, the nature-nurture debate. A little detail here that's actually really important. Uh, one reason, so I'm a psychologist, and one reason I like the mind is it's a total mess. <laughs> you know, the body is really complex. Uh, my wife does functional medicine kind of work, and uh, you know, it's fascinating, the chemistry, I'm really into it, but it's kind of boring. <laughs> the mind, <laughs> what a mess. So psychologists as a profession, including academic psychologists, have had to develop very sophisticated statistical tools to tease apart the mess of it all. And one of the useful applications of that has been related to the classic nature versus nurture question. What are the sources of who we are? And the more that, as you said, who a person is or who we are is somehow fixed, uh, you know, baked in, that's nothing you could do about it. Well, then that moves, frankly, toward a sense of futility and ugh, can't do anything. So identical twin studies are routinely used as an example of this to make the assertion that, well, it's 50-50. Basically, half of the variation in who adults become 
uh, is baked into their inheritable factors. That's the way they describe it precisely, what is heritable. That leaves the other half to be acquired. So we have innate compared to acquired. That's roughly what was found with identical twin studies. But here's the deal. Twins who are adopted, I should have said that. So you take identical twins who are adopted and then you study them 30 years later. And you try to sort out, okay, what uh, of who they become is due to their heritable factors and what is due to other factors, you know, environmental factors and psychological factors. Well, the thing is that twins get adopted typically into middle class and upper middle class environments. That means that you're reducing the impact of so-called nurture in the broadest sense, including environmental inputs. When psychologists who deal with the mess of the mind uh, correct for that statistically, what we find in many, many different kinds of studies, is that only about a third of who people become, only about a third of the variation in adult development, in the acquisition of things like resilience, happiness, virtue, love, wisdom, anything we really care about, only about a third of the variation is innate. The other two-thirds is acquired, which is incredibly hopeful. Two -thirds it's hopeful of for the individual and also for the planet as a whole. Yeah, exactly right. And sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I'm rattling on here. I, think, I, mean, I, <laughs> well, I love the I love the rants because, you know, the thing is that it's through them that we can really get a glimpse through the lens and the glasses that Rick Hansen sees the world. I always tell my listeners that if you can temporarily at least put on the lens or understand the glasses that somebody else sees in the world, that's another way of breaking up your default neural network and stepping into a different reality. Is there some perspective? Is there some idea that they have or a way that they look at the world that could radically improve your life for the better? And so this idea that if only a third is innate and the rest is based on our experiences, choices. Our exposure, choices that we have. Choices then, as a society and choices as individuals shape us on average. To be crystal clear, some people's lives are more affected by heritable factors, for better or worse. For example, inheriting a, a genetically based serious crippling illness, that's going to cast a long shadow, actually. But on course. average, exactly right. Just like you were saying, Drew. It's really helpful. It's very helpful. And for the individual that's listening is that think about anything in your life that you have felt that you've struggled to make progress on. Yeah. And just inherently, if you actually just sat down, you know, we just recently had, uh, you know, I know a colleague of yours, uh, Kristen Neff. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Kristen Neff on the podcast. And she was saying, you know, just put your hand on your, on your heart or put your hand on your stomach or somewhere in your body and just feel that for a second to know that anything is possible. And through your own choices, you can create yeah. a different reality that's there for you. When you really step into that and the mindfulness around that, something beautiful happens where you can actually forgive yourself and actually start moving down the pathway of whatever it is that you want to do. So on that note, you know, you talked about your early, uh, you know, being in school and some of the myths that you were exposed to. And at a certain point in time, I believe this takes us now into like the seventies, you made the choice of exploring meditation. Oh yeah. Tell us about how you encountered it and what some of your early experiences were like. Wow. Well, uh, talk about looking at the world through the eyes of other people. Um, I grew up in a decent kind of middle, lower middle class home, suburbs of Los Angeles, I raised as a casual Methodist. Uh, and then I went off to UCLA, a time of great ferment, learned a little bit about psychology, but it seemed really boring because it seemed like running math, rats through mazes. So I got into the human potential movement, even in, in college. Uh, but still, it was fairly very Western. And then at the end of college, I thought, oh, I ought to learn more about Eastern cultures and religions and practices. So um, I dove into that uh, on a so-called whim. I do wonder about the operation of grace. Just it seems almost uncanny that I would be interested in that. And in the process of that, I encountered uh, the Eastern traditions, uh, and which have, of course, uh, thousands of years of background of contemplative practice of various kinds. Um, I learned probably most about the Buddhist tradition. It, it kind of appealed to me because it, particularly in the early teachings of the Buddha, it's very pragmatic, very practical. It's not very complicated, actually. It's, it's not religious in a lot of ways. It's just very direct. And it seemed immediately true to me. It spoke to me. It's like, you know, mm. when you feel like you've come home, to something that rings really, really deeply true. Wow, everything's changing. Your mind in particular is continually changing. If you try to 
freeze that process and grab hold of things and turn processes into things, you will create a lot of friction for yourself, the Buddha taught. You will suffer and you will make other people suffer as well. And it's possible, which relates to my you know, current book, that with your own practice over time, you really can, all of us, rest in a profound underlying sense of contentment and love and inner peace, even amidst the challenges and pleasures of this world. Wow, that's just a really radical teaching, actually. And it, it got me deeply interested right from the get-go, uh, both that we can develop. The Buddha did not claim any special supernatural powers, right? So we can all do it. It's like he's Coach Buddha, you know? He's looking back from <laughs> the top. Coach. Of, yeah, yeah. From the Mountain of Awakening saying, yo, do what you want, but the view's a lot better up here and you don't look that happy down there. You know, I don't mean better like he's superior or anything. I just mean, you know, we change, we grow, we develop over time. So that's kind of where it began for me in 1974. I was young and foolish. Uh, there was a lot of kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, silliness and romanticism in my own practice, but it, it rang true that within a few breaths, honestly, as you well know, you, you kind of spoke it a moment ago, a little bit ago, if you just take a few breaths, or like Kristen was teaching, Kristen Neff, put your hand on your heart. Slow down. What's it like to be you right now? Really, it's okay. What's it like to be you right now? And can you feel the clutter in your mind, the dust, the sediments gradually settling? So there's a sense of a kind of spaciousness and presence and beingness that's always the case. It's just full of dust. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really recognize it, but when the dust gradually settles inside your mind, you just feel like, okay, it's pretty good, pretty good place. And then you notice also when you kind of drop in, you're a lot more effective. You can run a business better. I have a business background. I'm very much in the real world. Um, you can be more patient with other people, do fewer things where you're pouring gasoline on the fire. You become more able to look at the world through the eyes of others because you're less attached to your own point of view, like you were saying previously. Uh, and you also find that um, you can be much more receptive to the joys of life because you're not involved in so much friction. And you can, you know, just honestly stare at a grain of sand and go, wow, look at the light sparkling, bouncing off that grain of sand. So anyway, that's been the beginning for me. A lot of contemplative traditions, I think of them as like multiple roots up the mountain of awakening, many roots up. Most of them have a religious framing. You don't have to do it that way. There's tremendous secular mindfulness these days that can take you very, very far up the mountain of awakening. Uh, so whatever route people like, you know, take the step that's in front of you. Can I tell you a rock climbing thing? Yeah, please, please. I know you're avid. Uh, oh, you I know, used to hiker well, yeah. and... <laughs> I did it a lot. But I do a lot less. Well, here's the thing. Well, often, you know, like I've taken hundreds of people climbing kind of in personal growth environments. It's all safe. I have a perfect safety record. I intend to maintain it. <laughs> anyway, so um, <clears throat> you'll see a beginner with, you know, their, their feet are on two good holds, kind of like standing on a ladder, their hands on two good holds as well, but they don't know what to do next, right? They, they can't get anything else. There's nothing else within reach. The thing to do is to stand up on the holds you've got, which will bring additional holds into reach, and then you can keep on going. So in this life, uh, it can seem kind of daunting to develop all the ways we want to develop to heal our brain, let's say, uh, to tap into its innate healing powers, let's say. It can seem kind of daunting, like that's just a really big deal, that's, that's too big. But the step that's right in front of us to take that's the step we can always take. Mm. You know, the most important minute of our lives is the next minute, minute after minute after minute, right? So that's one of the great lessons for me about practice, including reaching back to when I was young and really foolish. Um, just take the step in front of you. That's yeah. all I need to do. No one can stop you, but no one can take your step for you, which means that you will earn the, the fruits of your practice. Yeah, it's so, it's so beautiful. And it's also so global in the sense that when through various sources of inputs, the news, social media, whatever, we lose ourselves for a moment. And I often have friends say, yeah, I've been on social media way too much today and my mind has been all over the place and I've yeah. kind of allowed it to be hijacked. Okay, 
we take a pause and we say, what can we do from here? Yeah. I mean, just what do I need on a personal level? What do I need? Do I need a glass of water? Do I need a few yeah. moments of silence? Do I need just a little bit of time alone or a walk outside to be in nature mm. yeah. or practicing some gratitude? And then when I'm taking care of myself and my brain and my body, then now when I'm in a good place, when I'm mindful, when I've recentered and found my footing as your example you shared, now I can go and do good for the world that's out there if I so choose to. Now I can give attention to my business if I need to. I can do what I need to do for my family. It's yeah. always the first step is stepping back into the present moment and checking in with what we need right now. Yeah. I think about how moxie is an underrated spiritual strength, <laughs> more broadly. That kind of scruffy moxie. Like, I'm going to do what I can, right? I'm not going to be defeated by all this. I'm going to find strength inside, and I'm going to keep on going with a feeling, which I, I find is absolutely fundamental as a longtime therapist, of being on your own side, being for yeah. yourself. So you've had all these interesting experiences that which, which have brought you this intersection. Yeah. Um, as you talk about in your new book, Neurodharma, where you're bringing ancient tradition with the latest science that's there, the new science. And, you know, you've written many books and I want to understand the origin story of how you chose to wrap them together in these seven principles. I was listening to a podcast uh, that you did with your son. Mm. I, I, um, and he was saying that uh, from the outside perspective, uh, he was saying that he thinks that this is the book that you've had the most joy with. Yeah. So well, thank you, Drew. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear a little bit about like, you know, you've been talking about these concepts, but yeah. how do you bring them together in the intersection of this book and what was the yeah. purpose of doing so? Yeah. Um, well, while I, I love ideas, I love science, I'm deeply interested in all that. Uh, I'm at bottom a practice guy. I'm really interested in practice and what can people actually do, however messed up it is. Right now, to help things be a little bit better. So it's in that frame then that I got interested in, in what I think of as those seven fundamental practices or seven fundamental ways of being that we see perfected in the most admirable people who've ever lived. Pick your person, doesn't really matter to me, whoever that might be. And then think of them as a model of qualities you wanna develop in yourself. And then we work backwards from that to think about, okay, how can I actually grow that inside myself based on lasting changes in my own brain? So if we look at the great teachers, to me, we see seven qualities, steadiness, lovingness, fullness, by which I mean contentment and equanimity. There's an enoughness. It's nice to want more. It's nice to be ambitious. It's okay, dream big dreams, but there's a sense of enoughness already. So those three qualities hang together, steadiness of mind, mindfulness, concentration, presence, plus compassion, kindness, love, plus equanimity, resilience, and emotional balance. Those really hang well together. We also see a little more subtly and also more profoundly uh, in great beings, a sense of wholeness. They're integrated, they feel whole and complete, and they uh, engage their mind in a kind of non-dual sense, awareness and its contents together as a single field. They rest in a sense of being through which doing passes. And as I speak these, everyone can feel them. They're not esoteric, they're natural. They are our endowment. We don't tend to be in touch with them as much as we could be, but it's our home to be mindful and warm-hearted and calm and strong, and also whole, while in the fifth quality, nowness, present moment awareness, living right at the front edge of now, with its immediacy and delight and the freedom in which you're continually letting go of what's the case as the next thing arises. Receiving nowness, I call it. The sixth practice, there's a sense of inter interconnection, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, where you open into allness. You've relaxed increasingly the contracted sense of self. You can see this in these great beings. They're not possessive. They're not positional. They don't get caught up in fame and what the world thinks of them. There's an inner freedom there in that regard, and they feel buoyed by everything. They, As the joke has it, the 
as the Dalai Lama said to the hot dog vendor, please make me one with everything. <laughs> you know, there's that sense of it. And then last, uh, in all of them, a light shines through them that does not seem entirely their own. Uh, they speak of a sense of timelessness, of the absolute, of, of, of a stillness, a spaciousness, a vastness, an unconditioned possibility as the context of the unfolding of conditioned, determined, clockwork, Big Bang reality. So seven qualities, steadiness, lovingness, fullness, wholeness, nowness, allness, and timelessness. I allowed myself to be a little more poetic and lyrical uh, in the way I wrote this book. So these are the seven qualities. And I think uh, they really summarize just about any great teacher you could think of. And you can um, feel inside yourselves the way that, yeah, yeah, I'd like to be more rested in those. And so what I did in the book is I grabbed hold of the absolute coolest, latest neuroscience, the most practical cutting edge neuroscience, and applied it to the development. Okay, how do you use brain science <laughs> to develop steadiness of mind? How do you do, use brain science, like we were talking about earlier, to retain compassion in your heart for people who piss you off? Okay, right? How do you use brain science to rest in a feeling of contentment in a culture that is designed in many ways to fuel craving, uh, mm. the kind of craving that leads to a lot of suffering and harm, flagged by the Buddha as well 2,500 years ago. How do you actually do that, right? What do you do in your brain so that you're totally in the present? Wow, what's going on in your brain when you feel one with everything? Right? <laughs> what's happening in your brain when you edge toward nirvana? When you start moving into these spaces that people report, and many people have had experiences of where the ordinary sense of consciousness just drops out and something radically different starts shining through. What the heck? <laughs> because these things can often seem very esoteric and yeah. they can seem very other. Yeah. And we have to think that we have to go to India yeah. on pilgrimage and yeah. sit up in the Himalayas. Uh, you know, for a long time and that magically one day just from being very still very that good. they'll be embraced. And what I love about what you're writing about in, in this new book is that you know, there's actually things that are going on in the brain and actually on a practical level, we can create habits and incorporate yeah. practices, as you've mm -hmm. mentioned, where we can em embody them. So I'm curious about the order and as one example, mm -hmm. so why is steadiness first mm -hmm. and what is an example of some of that latest neuroscience and how it applies to the concept of steady, steadiness? Well, that's great. Um, and to underline something you just said there a second ago, and by the way, Drew, this is a lot of fun. You know, I could, we, you're, you're good to talk with. I'm really enjoying speaking with you. Appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and exactly like you said, uh, we could other as a verb these ways of being like, Oh yeah, that's for them. Right. Or, Oh, that's for a yoga camp once a, once a week, you know, once a year, right. For a week. No, these are qualities really we can develop in everyday life. We can change the circuitry in our own brains so that we have greater steadiness of mind, for example. So why is it first? Um, I had to put these in some kind of order, you know, I could have put timelessness first, you know, some people would, you know, get a sense of the infinite and inside of that do your practices. But for me, kind of logically, if you can't regulate your attention, you're just dead in the water. I, I often think of it, if I could just jump in really quickly, yeah. when I was looking at the order and reading about each one, I almost saw it as a foundational piece. It's a foundational yeah. piece. It's very hard to get into timelessness yeah. if we can't start at the basics. It's very yeah. hard to build, uh, you know, it's very hard to build a business empire if we can't first start with balancing our own checkbook yeah, know, exactly and do right. our own budget on a on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to know where you are. You need to know what's happening inside you. You need to know what's happening around you. It's very fundamental. Going back to being in the mountains in the middle of a storm, find your footing. You know, where do you stand? So we got to start with some kind of steadying and stabilizing. Also, from a neuroplasticity standpoint, what we rest our attention on is the front end of who we are becoming. Attention is like a spotlight and vacuum cleaner. It illuminates what it rests upon and then sucks it into the brain. And as William James put it a long time ago, the education of attention would be the education par excellence, right? So mm -hmm. most people, though, are highly distractible. Their attention is skittering around all over the place. It's not stable. And there are really good practices that you can do to stabilize your mindfulness, 
it's easy to be mindful for half of a breath. Can you stay in the present for four breaths in a row? That's less than 30 seconds for most people. Can you stay in the present for 10 breaths in a row, for a minute, let's say, in a row? That's where it starts challenging, right? So developing that is good, how to do it. I'll give you one uh, brain science thing that's really cool and kind of wild. Please. So, yeah. Um, if we are steadily present with something, Maybe we're focused on the feeling of breathing. Maybe we want to stay present with our friend. Uh, maybe we're in a business meeting in the afternoon. It's really boring. We're sleepy. We want to keep our mind head in the game. Okay. What's going on? Well, functionally, physically in your brain, if you're steadily with something, the contents of what's called working memory remain stable. You know, you're, you're still with whatever it is you want to be with, okay? For those contents to remain stable, it means that a kind of gate that controls what is being represented by the neural circuitry of working memory, that gate stays closed. So you just keep focusing on your breath or you keep focusing on what your partner is telling you or you keep focusing on your boss's voice in that meeting droning on. You stay with whatever you're focused on. What keeps that gate closed? The gate is regulated by dopamine. When we feel rewarded, dopamine levels remain stable and the gate stays closed. But if we feel unrewarded, if what's happening doesn't feel enjoyable or meaningful or interesting in some way, whew, dopamine levels drop, the gate opens, and then we become much more open to other inputs. This is effective in the wild. You know, if there you are, a little monkey in a tree eating your banana, you stay focused on your banana in your tree. But if the bananas run out in your tree, well, boom, understandably, you become much more available to stimuli from outside you about other bananas and other trees. So the other thing, the way the gate works, is that when there's a spike of dopamine, when there's a surge of new reward opportunity, the gate opens again uh, because we got to attend to that other thing. So if a cute looking monkey swings onto a branch <laughs> nearby in your tree, forget the bananas. What bananas? Yo, how are you doing today? You know what I mean? So uh, it's a very effective, simple mechanism that's grounded in dopamine. The practical takeaway is this. If what we're trying to pay attention to, such as our object of meditation, feels flat or dull, or you know, not juicy at all, understandably, where minds are gonna wander. We're not getting enough stimulation. On the other hand, if we're focused on something that is interesting and stimulating, such as uh, the sensations in the whole body as we breathe, or the feeling in the whole body as we walk, which is more stimulating than just tracking the sensations of breathing around your upper lip, say. And also, if we are experiencing a lot of positive emotion, even if it's subtle, like a subtle sense of peacefulness and tranquility that's really delicious, fundamental sense of well-being, or maybe we're, we're marinating in, in happiness or even bliss, which are traditional factors of meditative absorption. By definition, we're getting high levels of dopamine in addition to steady ones. And when you're having steady levels of dopamine that are at the top of their range, you keep the gate closed and you prevent spikes of new dopamine opportunities from distracting you because you're already at the ceiling of dopamine levels. If so intensifying the happiness and, and the pleasure of what you're focused on will help steady your mind. Happiness is skillful means. No, I love that. I love it. And basically, let's say if you are struggling with your meditation, you're not enjoying it or you can't stay focused, you could spice it up. There's a lot of things that you can do. Spice it up. To bring Great it in. Great said. You could spice it up and you can do different things. You can try a mantra if you never tried that. You can try a walking meditation, just doing even something that brings you into that. And, you know, there's all different people have different thoughts and ideas and arguments and want to fight about what meditation vehicle is there. Ultimately, you have to find something that you could do right now that, that could be a starting place for you. Yeah. Heartfelt emotion. Uh, loving kindness, compassion, that's an object of meditation that you can become increasingly absorbed in. And um, as you become absorbed in it, whatever the beneficial, wholesome experience is, it is getting absorbed in you. Mm. So as you become absorbed in loving kindness or compassion, you are developing traits of loving kindness and compassion. If you marinate in gratitude, take gratitude as your object of meditation. 
or the felt sense of calm strength, which is really useful these days <laughs> in the useful. plagues that we're dealing with right now. Uh, calm strength. You take that as your object of meditation. Uh, yeah, that's great. Spice it you, up. You shared a quote earlier, and I thought of it when um, I've been familiar with this quote, uh, and I think I've even shared it on social media before, but you said the brain is like Velcro for bad experiences, right? That's our yeah. neg negativity bias. It was yeah. evolutionarily designed to pay attention. Even research showing for early is like toddlers, you know, pay attention to more negative experiences than positive experiences. You've read that. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's like um, Teflon. No, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, not Teflon. What's the word that you use? Teflon for good ones. Teflon, like a pe Teflon pan, a nonstick pan for yeah. good ones. Good ones just fly right off and bad ones stick. See and you later, gratitude. Bye-bye, <laughs> love. So and, long, wisdom. <laughs> and, and why I think that's so key, especially in, in this day and age, is that because our brain tends to focus on the negativity, when we don't have a sense of steady, steadiness, when we haven't embraced yeah. it, when we're not practicing it, other inputs come in, we get distracted, and more likely than not, it's going to be a negative input that gets a hold of us. Very and when that good. negative input gets a hold of our brain, is very you have a downward spiral. And unless yeah. if you consciously break out of that, that's why when you go on social media, or you go on Facebook, and people start sharing different things, and you go down the spiral, if you're not focused, if you're going in just completely, you know, not maintaining a sense of steadiness, those inputs, conspiracy theories, ideas will hijack your brain. You'll go down a rabbit hole and you'll think like an hour later, like, I don't feel good. Like, what the hell just happened? That's super well articulate. I, I should ask you a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, I really appreciate, uh, you know, the lessons and the explanation of how neuroscience uh, comes in. I know we only have a little bit more uh, time that's here. I want to talk a little bit about your practices that, that you bring mm, in. Yeah. Um, what are some of the ways that still today that you're able to incorporate for you on a personal level? You know, everybody wants to know what yeah. you do on a personal level. It's a great question, isn't it? We want it. I don't care what they think. I want to know what they do. Yes. Yeah. And with you being an avid person that says, you know, I care about the science, care about the research, care about everything yeah. like that that's important. But ultimately, I want to put the emphasis on the practices. Yeah. What are some of the practices that you do on a daily basis that incorporate some of these seven principles? Yeah, that's great. Um, so I've been at this for a while, and it's it just natural to say that. So what I might do myself might seem a little subtle or something, but it, it's not out of reach for anyone. Uh, one is that I try to stay in touch with an underlying feeling that's innate to us in our own psychology and in my view as well starts edging into something that's transpersonal but an, people don't have to go to that place if they don't want to just innate in our own ordinary psychology you can be in touch with an underlying undisturbed spaciousness of awareness that has qualities in it deep down inside of um, serenity and lovingness and contentment. You can feel that. You can feel that while you're also appalled or worried or focused on making a cup of coffee when you get up in the morning. You know, you can feel both. And, and I want to just, it may seem kind of obvious or simple. Most of us are not in touch with both. The truth is you can feel both. While you're upset with your friend, you can feel an underlying stability of lovingness inside yourself, for example, while you're really worried about uh, what to do in the country, let's say, or you're fascinated by what's happening in the streets, you can stay in touch with this underlying feeling of well-being as the container or the field of all of it. So I, that's a lot my practice. I, I try to do that in real time every day. Another thing I really try to do <laughs> going to the negativity bias is disengage from friction quickly. To feel it, totally not fake it, no spiritual bypassing here, right? No rose-colored glasses. Feel it, but disengage fast. Uh, just don't feed it, don't follow it. Uh, and what would be examples of the friction? Yeah. So I roll out of bed. Um, I, you know, wake up, uh, I read political Twitter a little bit, and I suddenly see this, you know, comment about a comment, and my mind is starting to get drawn into that 
idiot who said that thing. Don't they understand? Blah, blah. Here I am arguing in my mind with someone that someone reposted on Twitter. <laughs> what a waste of time, right? That's a form of friction for me. You know, contentiousness. It's, a, it's interesting. It's a, it's a rubbing up against life, right? It's or, when you notice yourself arguing with some version of reality yeah. that's out there. Yeah, that's a form of friction. Or my wife comes out and, um, you know, she's a little sleepy. I want a real good hug. She's got other things on her mind. Uh, she just kind of keeps on rolling on by. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, why don't you give me a bigger hug? You know, <laughs> and then I'm thinking, I don't need to go there. Like, yeah, maybe later I'll say, hey, honey, let's have more of a hug, whatever. Uh, but I don't need to get caught up in it. I don't need to follow it. That's where we really get in trouble. So I, that's a very, and, and it's interesting, when everything's fun, you can afford to be a slob. <laughs> when, you, when you're at sea level, you can jog with a brick in your backpack. But when you're at 20,000 feet helping your friends up the mountain, you can't afford that stuff. So I think right now we're in the middle of a lot of trouble. And when you're in the middle of a lot of trouble, you can't afford your, dare I say it, different forms of BS. You know, you just got to drop it, including understandable reactions from your childhood that get brought into the present. I get it, you know, um, you know, but we just can't afford them. But that's different from a course of claiming what you actually recognize is true and what you really, really care about. I'm not talking about pushing away anything that's really healthy, anything that's really important. But I think we can admit that we get into a lot of needless friction inside our own mind. So I'll let, try to let that go. And I'd say last thing, just if I could really fast, I try to be in touch with this feeling of loving peacefulness, peaceful lovingness, that intersection of calm and compassion where there's an open-hearted, kind of an open-hearted peacefulness or a peaceful open-heartedness. You can feel the two together. Uh, sometimes it's more active. It's like compassion and clarity both together. So, for example, when you see someone out there in the world you disagree with, you can have crystal clear clarity about them and what you think while keeping an open heart and not letting the poison of hatred invade you and, and remain. Mm. Because all that is just another way of doubling down on the ego and the other, which keeps us trapped into this limited view. So we sometimes yeah. feel like we need to make somebody wrong yeah. instead of, okay, hey, I disagree with this person. We have two totally different views on the politics or the situation that's at hand. And I still recognize them as a human being. You know, yeah. they're still doing their best. And in most cases, you know, one of my friends, Peter Crone, on a past podcast said, in a lot of those circumstances, if you've gone through those exact same experiences that they went through, if you were brought up in the exact same household, you would often think in many cases like they would. So have a little bit of compassion for the people that are out there that you yeah. disagree with. I know. And it's a very interesting um, thing that I'm working on in myself uh, to recognize the truth of things of whatever kind and to recognize frankly when the other person is absolutely wedded to certain beliefs about reality that are just not the case but there's no budging them and they're motivated not to budge they don't enter a dialogue in an open inquiry into what is actually true help me i want to i want to learn there's there's no interest in that, nor is there any interest in fair play. You know, there's no interest in the other person, let's say, in that fundamental principle that we support in sports and business, basically, that rules for me or rules for you, rights for you or rights for me. You know, if it's bad, if I do it, it's also bad if your team does it too, right? But in politics, you see often people who are complete hypocrites, uh, they say one thing, they do another, they don't care. And after a while, you start to realize, oh, that's what I'm dealing with here. I'm not dealing with someone who's operating with these two fundamental principles, tell the truth and play fair. They're just not there in good faith. And it's an interesting um, practice to, on, to honor that recognition, if that's reality. You know, if, the, if, 
it, it's reality. You, you really start to see it. They might still be a nice person to their kids. They might like chocolate. You might have compassion for them if they've had really bad news about their, their physical health, let's say. But still, you start to realize, oh, the, that's what they're committed to. And I'm not going to budge them. And there's no sense in getting caught up in friction about that. Uh, you don't have an argument focus. with them in your head that yeah. they, you wish that it would be different. It's like, that's the way that it is. Yeah. I'm not going to have them budge. They have these thoughts and ideas that even might be at a disservice, not just to mm -hmm. others, but to, yeah. to themselves too. Yeah. But I'm not going to waste my time arguing in my head over it. Instead, let me do what I can and take action yeah. on however I want to make the world a better place. Yeah. And that relates actually to the opening quotation from me. The passage that I wrote recently was in a, I have a free weekly newsletter. It uh, goes out 150,000 people. Check it out. Each week, it's a little practice. It's a thing to do. And in the last week, um, I stuck my neck out. And the title of this practice is vote. You know, for example, in the last U.S. presidential election, essentially half the people sat on the sidelines and shrugged and said, whatever, you know, Democrat, uh, Republican, yeah, same old, same old, doesn't matter to me, whatever. And I'm not telling people how to vote, but I think it's important to vote and not just at the ballot box every four years or, you know, intermittently along the way. Vote with your words, your deeds, your viewpoints, you know, vote with another person to disengage from a silly quarrel or to actually speak up and say, you know, what's really in your heart. You know, take the power that you do have, do what you can. Um, and to me, part of the process here is not so much trying to convince other people to change their vote, but to convince half the freaking country to vote at all, including mm -hmm. bluntly younger people. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, you, as people get older, the voting rates increase. Um, in the last um, presidential election, uh, you know, large, large fractions of young people did not vote, even though they're the ones who will most inherit the consequences of global climate change, social injustice, wealth inequality, and all the rest of that. So, um, you know, that to me is kind of a bottom line takeaway. Claim the power you actually do have inside your own mind. Vote inside your mind. We cast votes inside our own, your own mind. Get informed. Take a position. Decide what you think is important. You may disagree with me, but it, at least vote. You know? mm -hmm. Well said. Take, yeah. Well, Rick, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. I want to be mindful of your time over here. You've mentioned a few different things. Uh, we'll get to the book in a second, but the newsletter, uh, what's the name of it and where do people go to sign up? Oh, thank you. It's called Just One Thing. I really respect people's email addresses, never sell them. Um, we treat people with respect. It's called Just One Thing. It's free. It's weekly. Go to my website uh, or any, or just search on my name. You'll immediately see how to do it. And I should mention as well, if it's okay. Please. Um, I, I taught the book, Neurodharma, uh, which is not a religious book. It's a book of hardcore, super cool practice, you know, that you can use in the trenches of your real life to become, you know, more mindful, calmer, and happier along the way. And I taught that material also in a 10-day meditation retreat. Mm. So we really got into it. You know, we took a day for each one of the seven fundamental practices with a couple of days on the edges. And we turned that into an online program. So if people go to my website, they can see that Neurodharma online program, which is really well done. Videotapes, bonus materials, guided meditations, and all the rest of that. And we love giving out scholarships to people with genuine financial need. Uh, what's really, really, really important to us in, in a way, part of the function of doing these programs for people who can, they're inexpensive, for people who can afford them, is to help people around the world have free access to this kind of material. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I really encourage people to check out that online program. And, and if I could stress one point about my own practice is do something every day. Little things really add up over time. You know, that's the most fundamental thing. And engaging something like that Neurodharma online program is a great way to practice in a regular way. And, you know, these little steps we take, right, up the mountain of awakening may seem, may seem individually small, no million dollar moments, but they will gradually take us to a better place. Ah, beautifully said. And I think uh, so key for anybody who's felt like they want to do it all at the same time. It's either all or nothing. It's like we could start with baby steps. We could start with yeah. little things that we could do, as you mentioned, every day to actually make progress down. So I have the link for the, um, 
the newsletter and the online course in the show notes and in the email that goes out to the audience. Thank and the you. book Neurodharma is out. It's yeah. out there. People can get it. And, uh, and I know you'll be continuing to do other podcasts and things like that. So we'll link to a few of those that are there. Um, out of those seven principles, just, you know, I'm sure mm. they're all your favorites, just like every baby's your favorite too. <laughs> all my children. Is, is, there, is there one of those that's really speaking to you right now that you, that you just want to highlight? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the one that, so I, I have a heavily referenced book. The reference notes are buried Six, in the back. 600 references in the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> For those who care about that stuff, you know, it's really great. Uh, and, but there were things that I came across that surprised me. And one of the really interesting, powerful things that is so relevant today is getting a sense of things as a whole. It may sound abstract, but people right now can get a feeling of your chest as a whole as you breathe and your body as a whole as you breathe. Or you can be aware of the room you're in as a whole. Or you can extend your gaze out more toward the horizon or imagine kind of a bird's eye view perspective. On, this, on your life these days, your situation, uh, and also kind of time as a whole, you know, the, 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 the largeness of time, you know, nearly 14 billion years so far, uh, many other laps around the sun to come, you know, the sense of things as a whole. And neurologically, what that does is like about five really good things. <laughs> you know, when you get a sense of things as a whole, you come into the present, uh, you have less sense of me, myself, and I, my precious, you know, my position, <laughs> my righteous belief, whatever. That starts calming down. Um, you get less caught up in craving and ruminating and desiring. And you have more of a sense of things all together, just the whole thing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I would really encourage people to do, and that's in the wholeness practice, the wholeness practice. It also is about feeling whole as a person. You're enough already. Mm -hmm. You really are. You're complete. You're whole. Yeah. There's some creepy crawlers in the basement of your mind. You got to deal with that. You know, you got to work with it, but they don't have to be exiled. They don't have to be shunned and shamed. You can be whole as you are right now. It's fantastic practice and um, ways into it are, like I said, get a sense of your chest as a whole as you breathe, your body as a whole, get a sense of the space you're in as a whole, keep your gaze moving out to the horizon from time to time so you have more of a sense of everything all together. Uh, that's a really powerful practice and it's really one that's incredibly important today. We're in this pickle in terms of our two plagues, you know, the coronavirus plague, because we're profoundly social, we're connected. That's why we're vulnerable to this plague. And that's why we must deal with it through cooperative action with each other for the common, the shared good. Second, we're dealing with this long plague of racism of different kinds and social division and dealing with these authoritarian demagogues who classically, as has been done throughout history, play up on divisiveness to you know, hold on to their own wealth and power. Um, and so, to deal with that as well, um, we need to appreciate the whole. We need to appreciate that our own privilege, uh, the privilege for me is a cost for you, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my privileges are, are acquired through costs for you. And um, I need to recognize that fact. For example, we're in this whole thing. And, you know, if there's injustice for one, there's injustice for all. And yeah, maybe they're coming for, you these days, but eventually they'll be coming for me. Mm. Uh, so we're in us as a whole, and and it's a very wise perspective, right? As well as at the psychological level, people can just try it. Get that sense of the whole, opening out into the whole. You'll feel calmer. You'll feel less righteous and beleaguered, uh, and it'll become clearer to you what the next step is that would be useful to take. Mm. Beautifully said. Well, Dr. Rakanson, I want to thank you for coming on and giving us a little glimpse and embarking into the whole together. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing it together. It's the wholeness yeah. and we're hearing it together. Yeah. And uh, I want to acknowledge you for the great work that you've been putting out over the years and all the books that you've been writing that have really mm -hmm. uh, had a chance to help people expand the mind and open it and step into mindfulness, but also, which is very useful, understand how the, the science plays into it too. Yeah, because that's very helpful for a lot of people to know that that there's actual the science to, to back it up. So thank you for coming on the podcast and thank you for the incredible work that you do. 
Drew, it's a pleasure and an honor actually to do this with you. And I hope it's been helpful to people. Absolutely. Thank you again for being here and uh, wishing you all the best. Thanks.